welcome into Thimbleberry U. I am John Jagge, joined as always by Amy Wells from Thimbleberry Financial. Amy, always a pleasure to be with you. Jag, it is always great to talk to you. Talking about a really important topic today, too. That is the nuts and bolts of estate planning. We've probably all heard this term of estate planning, but what actually is involved in estate planning? I know it's important, but let's get down, like you said, to in the title here, nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, I think people use estate planning in different ways depending on their level of knowledge. And so in its simplest form, it's really jag the legal documents that help with decision making and the handling of assets when someone is incapacitated or dead. Mm -hmm. So the most common assets are a will, a financial power of attorney, often called a durable power of attorney, a healthcare directive also sometimes referred to as advanced directive or living will or advanced healthcare directive, okay? And possibly a trust. Now, there's lots of forms of trust. So here I'm going to focus on revocable living trusts, which are a lot like a will, but more complex and they do more things. But think of it almost as like a will replacement, if you will. Usually a will is included within a revocable living trust. So An estate plan, though, I think that's simplest form, which probably was not simple at all, (laughs) as I think back on what I said. But estate plan can also reference additional death and incapacity related items such as life insurance, Mm -hmm. beneficiary designations, funeral instructions. And then, as we've talked about before, we've talked about the others, but digital logins and passwords, right? We can have the legal documents and those are important, That said, in a complete estate plan, you usually just don't have the documents. You're going to have these other items that play a role in completing the estate plan picture. Especially as we get more and more online in our lives, that's so important. So you did do a good job of breaking this down, Amy, but I think there is a certain complexity to just this by nature. So my next question for you would be, do you need to involve an attorney when you create an estate plan? I think, Jag, you answered that question with your words. It is complex by nature. So for that reason, I do think it absolutely makes sense to have an attorney involved. Is it absolutely required? No, but it is a good idea. And I'll keep saying that. The reason that I think it's a good idea is that it is complex. There's a lot of education and training that's required to understand the complexities of law in a specific state, and the states are different, and for the federal government. Sure. As people, we don't know what we don't know. Right. We only assume. So a professional is there to know the ins and outs, to realize what you know and what you don't know, and to be able to guide you. That means that they're letting you know your options and they're making recommendations on how you can handle certain situations. There are definitely tricky situations that we hear about from clients frequently. One of those is that, hey, we've picked the guardian we want for our kids, right? If they pass away, who are their kids going to? But you know what? They're not the best with money. Ah. We're a little concerned with them also controlling the money for our kids, How can we keep those things separate? That's an estate planning question that goes to an attorney. Another question, again, often related to children, but maybe to siblings, maybe other people that they've been close to at some point is, hey, there's this person in my life and I really don't want them to get any of my assets. How do I make sure that they don't? And that could be somebody who is just irresponsible with money. Or that could be a family relationship that unfortunately has turned sour. I'm sure many of our listeners, if not all of them, have seen that at some point. Absolutely. Another question that comes up is, do I need a trust or is a will enough? Mm -hmm. And there are pros and cons to having a trust or not having a trust. And since, you know, I'm not an attorney, my team aren't attorneys, we're not going to make that legal recommendation. But we do regularly talk with clients about those pros and cons and and what their options are. Right. A trust often is more involved than a will. And we aren't attorneys, nor do we play one on a podcast. So let me ask you, what is a trust specifically and what does it do? So as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of different types of trusts. So again, I'm going to keep this conversation focused on a revocable living trust. What that means is while someone's alive, they can change the terms of the trust. Okay. So I just want us to keep that in mind revocable. Okay. So to understand trust, I think we have to start at the simplest level. And that is one of two places. I'm going to choose to start with beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. 
So on certain types of accounts, like a 401k, 403b, IRA, you can add a beneficiary. Life insurance, also you add a beneficiary. Sure. Any asset that has a beneficiary named at someone's death passes directly to the beneficiary. Makes sense. Okay, that's really important to know. The things we're talking about here with wills and trusts are not assets that have beneficiaries listed. This would fall under the other column. Yes, it's things like bank accounts and your house and non-qualified accounts. Now, there are some ways on those things, depending on the asset and depending on the state, to add a beneficiary designation. So first, at its simplest form, there's really two places we can start. And I'm going to choose to start with assets that have beneficiaries added. Beneficiaries are who your money goes to if you're no longer alive. And usually there's a primary beneficiary or beneficiaries or contingent, meaning if the primary are no longer alive, money goes to the contingent. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about assets that pass through your estate, we're not actually talking about those with beneficiary designations like a 401k or a 403b or life insurance because that money passes directly. We're talking about things like bank accounts or your house or um, brokerage accounts. Got it. Okay. Now, depending on the asset, And depending on the state, those can have a beneficiary designation added on. And we often will look at that with a brokerage account with clients and say, hey, if you don't have a trust, should we maybe do this? But my point is, we're not talking about assets with beneficiaries here. So if we don't have a will in place, we die what's called intestate. It just means not having a will. Mm -hmm. A will is a basic estate planning document that says, here's where my assets go when I die. Here's where my kids go, et cetera. It sounds like a Latin phrase, intestate. Yeah. Probate is the court that administers wills and decides how to distribute property. You said administer wills. This is what we're talking about, not having a will here. Exactly. So the probate court is the court that administers wills. However, they also deal with when people die intestate. Okay. And when they do that, how they do it is according to how it is believed most people would want their assets distributed. But if you die intestate, there's no will. Your wishes aren't known. So it's just this general kind of formula. That's that, Yeah, that's a little dangerous with the assumptions if you haven't stated your wishes. Okay. Absolutely. You're not here to experience it, but your loved ones are. Yeah. So I think sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to be here. Why does it matter? Your loved ones still go through this. And it definitely can leave an impression for them around how much you cared. Wow, that's powerful. Okay. So the next level of estate planning after intestate for death is a will. Mm -hmm. So again, this is going to go through probate. Um, The probate process is public record. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Anybody can find out anything about what happens in the probate courts. Wow, okay. Okay, because of this, it also can be a longer process. Mm -hmm. And with a will, the probate courts really just need to sign off, but they have to make sure that there's no debt, you know, that people are trying to collect on, um, these types of things, and it just gets drawn out. That process of having it drawn out can actually get expensive. Right. Legal fees. You're talking legal fees could come out of whatever you've left behind, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think people don't think about that with a will oftentimes. So then the next layer is a revocable living trust. And so to answer your question, what is it? What does it do? So when you pass away, if you have a revocable living trust, the trust takes over at death and it is very hard for someone to change the outcome of that trust. Okay. Okay. So It is now irrevocable at the moment you pass away. So words that I've sometimes heard used are it's set in stone. And that's not a, may not be 100% accurate because someone could challenge it, but it really describes the difficulty involved in making changes to it. If I understand this right, Amy, revocable while you're alive and when you pass, it then becomes, like you said, set in stone in most cases and irrevocable once you're gone. Correct. Absolutely. You got it. So when you pass away and you have a trust, a successor trustee steps in. Um, That's someone named in the trust. Normally, you know, if I have a trust, I am my own trustee while I'm alive. But obviously, at the time I pass away, I can no longer serve in a trustee capacity. And so the successor trustee steps in to account for the assets and get them transferred to the beneficiaries named in the trust. Mm -hmm. 
one of the benefits of a trust is that it is not public record. Oh. So what's happening is now private. That can be important depending on your individual situation. And now we'll go from uh, set in stone to dirty laundry. Pick a different cliche here. Absolutely. And so as an advisor, I'll say, hey, we hear a lot about uh, celebrities that have not done estate planning when they pass away. And I think the general public hears about some of that too. And, and those estates will get picked apart. Right. And there's a lot of knowledge that's passed around. The trust can help avoid some of those issues. Here in Detroit, Aretha Franklin passed away a couple of years ago. Obviously a very big name overall, but especially here in Detroit. I don't know all the details. I don't know how much of it was under lock and key, but I don't think it was set in stone because her family is fighting tooth and nail to get all those assets and it's all out for everybody to read about. So your point is very well taken. It's interesting what can happen when people pass away and there's money or even when there isn't much money. So one of the other benefits of a trust is it can be very helpful if estate taxes are due. So federal government says that if you die and your assets over a certain level, and that number changes, so I'm not going to worry about quoting that, you can owe money. Now here in Oregon, that estate tax threshold is only a million dollars. Which sounds like a lot when you say a million dollars, but when you talk about somebody's total assets and you're talking about houses, cars, bank accounts, retirement accounts, it's not as hard as you think to get to a million dollars. And additionally, it includes proceeds from life insurance. Ah, there you go. So in Oregon, a lot of people are going to get hit with a state tax. So when you have a trust, one of the things that the trustee can help do is before assets are distributed, make sure the estate tax has been paid or that money's been held back. Can you imagine if you and your sibling inherited money, you think everything's taken care of and the final tax return gets filed for your parents and all of a sudden you find out, oh, this much is due in estate tax and now that needs to come out of the assets you have to pay it. Oh, yeah. Um, so that can be a benefit of a trust. Now, a downside of a trust, though, is that assets must be titled properly to be included in the trust. And for folks who are older, that's a little easier to do. But can you imagine your checking account, your checks, if you ever wrote checks anymore, <laughs> uh, saying the revocable trust of JAG? Like some people say, gosh, I don't want that. Like somebody's going to have a hard time cashing that. They're not going to believe it or you know, I'm 30 years old and I don't want my houses and my cars and all of these things to have to be bought in the name of the trust, my bank accounts. That just feels funny. So especially the revocable trust of Jag. Jag's not even my legal name. <laughs> all right. So let me ask you another question here, Amy. This does sound pretty involved. And we've talked earlier about why it can be beneficial to have a legal professional because there's so many moving parts here. Can you give me an idea of how much it would cost to you know, pay for this work to have all this done? Because I got to imagine that goes into people's decision-making process. It definitely does. Uh, we hear that frequently. How much it's going to cost will be different in different parts of the country and with different attorneys. It's also going to be based on complexity, right? If you're getting a will and advanced directive and durable power of attorney, that's a lot less expensive than trust work plus the other documents, right? So I can't begin to speculate on what that's going to cost for someone. That's really where a consultation with an attorney needs to come into play. But what I'd say is most attorneys will have a consultation some amount of time for free because just like with working with an advisor, there needs to be a fit. I will also add that I think in choosing to work with an attorney, it's important to have a game plan for what your estate plan looks like and what the documents that need to be drafted are. Mm -hmm. So that before you go into it, there's a whole roadmap for your estate plan versus, oh, let's do this document now and this document later. And, oh, this issue came up. Oh, let's just add another estate planning document. I mean, that makes sense, Amy. You got it. Just like with so many things that we talk about in finances and in general, you got to start with the plan. Absolutely. And I think it's also good to note that if you have a financial advisor, they can work with your estate planning attorney. The two can talk to come up with a better solution or the best solution for you. So having that in mind, Amy, that we have to come up with a plan to start this whole process, what documentation do you need when you're going to go talk to an attorney? It sounds kind of expensive and onerous to start. Yeah. Well, first of all, know that it is not your job as an individual to come up with this plan or know exactly what documents you need. The professional needs to recommend based on your situation. 
I hear that a lot, but I'm not sure if I want a trust or a will. That shouldn't keep you from meeting with the attorney. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that most attorneys hold a free consultation. And so know that. Then they often have a document they'll ask you to fill out. It's usually a list of assets and their values. It's especially important to know what's in a retirement account or what isn't. They'll Now, for us, for our clients, if we know they're going to hold a consultation, we will run a report of their information and give it to them so that they can just take that in. Got it. It also is important to know what existing life insurance you have, who the owner is, et cetera. Again, we include that in our report when someone's going to go meet with their attorney. It's a good idea to have current beneficiaries on accounts to know that. And then to know who your important family members are or related parties that, you know, may play a role in your estate planning. And even the ones that you don't want to play a role in your estate planning. <laughs> Very important point if we come back to that. All right. So is this kind of one of those things where once you've got it done, you exhale and it's done and over with and it's all set? Or is this something needs to be looked at pretty frequently once you set up an estate plan? Well, Jack, can I say both? Okay. And the reason that I say that is once it's done, take a deep breath, sigh of relief, uh, enjoy the fact that you're done with this work for a little bit. And then know that at the end of that, you need to put on your to-do list to review your estate plan down the road. How often? Um, at a minimum, every few years. Okay. So five, 10 might be a little bit long. So there's a couple of things that can cause a change. So one laws change. You may not know that, but your estate planning attorney does. So they'll probably reach out to you with that. That's something to check with them. Will you contact us or will someone in your firm contact us if you're not there? If laws changed and my my estate plan isn't good any longer. Maybe your children are grown and grandchildren are now in the picture. That's a good reason to potentially update your estate plan. Uh, and outside of changes like that, every few years makes sense. Um, it's because your wishes may not be the same. Maybe you have a nonprofit receiving money in from your trust, for example. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't believe in the work they're doing any longer, or maybe they are no longer in existence. Or maybe you found the nonprofit you fell in love with on the other side of it. Sure. Exactly. And again, grandkids, grandkids become a big reason for changing estate planning. Got it. This is all really good information, Amy, and so important. We've said that in previous podcasts. You want to make sure that you have this in place. And as you said earlier in this podcast, you don't want to leave your family holding the bag and going to the courts and probate and all that stuff. It is really, really important. So if somebody wants to come talk to you about estate planning, anything related to their financial future, I know at Thimbleberry, you really focus on tech and healthcare clients, but there are many that you can talk to. If somebody wants to come talk to you, how do they do it? They can give us a call at 503-610-6510 or find us online at thimbleberryfinancial.com. Excellent. Good stuff. We'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Sounds great. Thanks, Jag. Registered representative, securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisor representative, Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Thimbleberry Financial are not affiliated.